Welcome to another episode of GUI challenges where I build interfaces my way and then I challenge you to build it your way because with our creative minds combined we're going to find multiple ways to solve these interfaces and expand the diversity of our skills and in today's GUI challenge we are building floating action buttons aka fabs and these are actions that you sort of want to have in your viewport at all times so that no matter where the user is scrolling they can have this particular action to add a new post or like something or whatever it is you've got it right there for them nice and easy next to your thumbs and I'm going to show you how I built mine but first let's check out this intro this is the lovely debugging corner where I have uh, multiple versions of Safari represented here I have Firefox represented over here Chrome on Android down here and Chrome on desktop and if you're noticing anything kind of silly right now about the way that, well, maybe not silly, but why is this one different? Look, this one's over here on the other side of the document. So this one's in the bottom right and this one's in the bottom left. What is going on? Well, maybe you've guessed it. I've used logical properties and I've changed the direction of the document to right to left. And if I go back to left to right, it's now on the side that you've probably known to come and love as a, a Westerner or, you know, reading mostly English. And in this case, uh, we've kind of articulated that the floating action button should go as we read from left to right and left to right and left to right. We're going to put an action there at the end of that line where you're reading. And if you're in a right to left language, well, logical properties lets me do that exact same UX consideration for folks reading from right to left. And that was just kind of a cool little, uh, cool little feature in there of using logical properties. You get to sort of make this internationally relative positioning very easy, right? I wrote one style instead of many to consider it later. You also might be noticing this little icon here. So this is the accessibility tree view. You can enable this by going to, um, well, here, go to settings at the settings cog, go to experiments and scroll down. You'll see enable full accessibility tree view in the elements panel. And here is why that's cool. So if I am to, let's just kind of pull this. So I guess I don't need to pull that open. Um, pull this down. Here's our fabs. So this is a group that's look it's even has a role group and an aria label that describes its um, floating action buttons. And then in each here we have a button. That's a button element. It has a class, a title, and an aria label. And an SVG icon was set to aria hidden true. Now maybe you're very well versed in accessibility and you know how this all gets interpreted into a screen reader but maybe you don't well hit this button and you can get a really good idea so here we can see our group floating action buttons this could be read out to a screen reader button uh, with the text of add new action currently focusable or it's fo focusable true if i tab in here it will be focused to true right this is kind of cool and notice that if i try to twirl it open there's nothing in there and that's because the contents were set to are you hidden true and it's already got a label, so everything is kind of fulfilled here. Um, a non-sighted user has all of this information to use before choosing any of these buttons. So kind of cool. I really like this feature and being able to go verify um, at a quick glance. Now, this doesn't replace testing on actual devices, um, but it is kind of a cool feature that way. One of the other things that I thought was interesting is the group here uh, with the role group is the one that's kind of controlling the layout and positioning of the buttons. And then each button just gets to be a button. So really, these are just icon buttons. They're not necessarily floating action buttons. In this particular case, I think what makes them floating is here. If I zoom in like we were looking at in the intro, you can see there's a shadow on them. And when I push, the shadow goes away. They also move down a little bit. So this definitely gives them the sense of floating. Um, so that's they're a little bit more unique than maybe a regular um, icon button. So here, command zero to go back to regular zoom size. Um, and that was cool. The fabs here are just using display flex, flex direction, column reverse. Oh, well, we're going to have to talk about that in a second. But place items center, look, if I take that off, oh, is place item center is shorthand for align item center and justify item center. So it looks like my preprocessor has populated those just for funsies. But look, if I go align items center and justify content center, I can see that all snap together. And look, we even got nice tools. If I hover over here, you can see where that's, they're kind of being pulled to. So there's the axis in the center going vertically because we're setting flex direction to column. And then we're setting items to align in the center. And we can see them being gravitationally pulled by flex into that center. They even lost their alignment of stretch there because we said align items center instead of align items stretch, which is the default. So cool tools helping us visualize. But let's talk about column reverse. So if I pop open our tools again, just go to regular column. This is what the floating action buttons are um, described in the document. So here, if I pull, oh, let me pull down our little uh, display here, drag this down. So here's our group. Here's our first button. 
Oh, look, it's on top. And then our heart button is underneath. Our secondary, our mini fab is underneath the other one. Well, that's not necessarily how design asked us to present this. Design wanted us to have the heavy weighted button on the bottom and the secondary options on top. And in fact, if we tab, we want to tab into this, this group of buttons and definitely get the primary action first and hit tab to get the other one secondary. So if I go back into here and change it back to column reverse, what we do is we get the effect that we want. So we have the document order that we want. So if I tab in that primary item that's first in the, the document here gets focused first. If I hit tab again, I go to the secondary button. And thanks to our sort order or, or kind of flex direction, we're able to reverse it visually. So visually, we see that weighted item on the bottom. But to the document, that item is first in the list. And so kind of a cool, tricky little interaction. In fact, I'm going to put a link in the show notes right now so that you can go see how the CSS working group is talking about how could CSS change the order visually and then have that inform the document order also? Because it's not always the same. Sometimes your, your visual order is different than your document order. And maybe you want the visual order to inform the document order. And how do you do that? Uh, and today, that's not very easy. So all right, that's enough accessibility talk and HTML talk. It's time to get into some CSS. Let's go check out the CSS. What do you think? Check out my styles. I've got some styles in the blind my styles. Yeah, yeah, my styles. Expand out. OK, did you like my little hold music as we transitioned into this view? I doubt it. I doubt you liked that because I didn't even like it. OK, anyway, let's just jump in. We have a viewport margin uh, being defined inside of the fabs container. And that's just so that we're trying to push away from the edge and we want to do that evenly. And uh, it, it looks nice if you share that with Gap. Right? So then you have the same space away from the edges. This is the same space you have between your items. Just made tons of sense for a container to control this. So we're fixed position. We have a little bit of Z index. We're using display flex. We've already talked about column reverse and placing our items. Our gap and our insets are all using that one custom property. And that concludes the, the layout for the group container, which I thought was kind of neat how that turned out so uh, succinct. Now let's talk about the fab item itself. So we've set a size here, and that's because the mini one can be set into a smaller size. So if we go check that out and we inspect the mini fab, fab with the extra class of mini, here we are. If we change this, look at how everything scales so nicely. Well, it's not so mini anymore, is it? It is now the mega fab. I like mini and mega. That was from the dialogue episode. That was, that was good stuff. OK, so anyway. It's just nice being able to have a single point of control for the sizing. And we're doing that all with custom properties uh, right here. So we're setting that to size. We use size in a couple other places, like as you can see here in the padding and in our SVG. So the inline size and the block size are set to that particular size. So the padding and the icon are all controlled from one single uh, point. Got to love custom properties and how they sort of cascade down. Really sweet. And if you're not familiar with GUI challenges and some of the patterns that we've been working with in the past, here's one that I really like, where we upfront define um, our light and dark variables, and then we pivot them um, later. So here, I'll briefly describe this one. So we have a light background, a light background hover color, and this is using open props. And in open props, as the numbers get higher, they become darker. So in a light background, we're going to have a pretty good, vibrant, dark pink. And then when we hover it, we're going to go even darker. And that's another rule in GUI challenges where hover and focus interactions should increase the contrast to make something more visible. You shouldn't hover something and have the icon disappear because it became too faint. Um, so anyway, open props helps us here because we can just hover and increase the number to get a darker color. And then the light theme, that's going to contrast more with the uh, color of the icon. So again, with dark, dark, we're going to pick a lighter pink. And then when we hover, we're going to go even lighter. And now we can start to use these props. So our background property is going to contain light by default. Same thing with our foreground. It's going to be light by default. So we have a light foreground and a dark foreground color. And here we can use those simple properties. So we have a background set to the background property, a color set to the foreground color property. And in dark mode, let's just switch down here to dark mode. If the um, user's preference is dark, we'll set the BG to the dark BG and the foreground to the dark foreground. So these things become really sort of um, descriptive. So the properties are descriptive of what they hold. And then when we flip the values, they become descriptive of the adapting that they're doing. So they're adapting to this particular media query. And that base property is now adapting itself to a darker context. We did that even here with the motion. So if I uh, scroll down here, so motion reduced is going to hold what is OK to animate when motion is reduced for that user. And that's going to be box shadow and background color. If motion is OK, 
we're going to also, we're going to keep animating box shadow and background color, but we're going to additionally animate the transform and the outline offset. And then here's our transition base property set to motion reduced by default. Our transition is set to transition, right? So just like we did with the foreground and the background. And then if motion is OK, we'll flip that transition base property to the motion OK property. And so now we have this adaptive system where everything is very declarative and our switches are really clear and concise about where they're switching and they're only switching one thing at a time, which is kind of cool. All right, let's review a little bit more of the styles here. Our padding is just half the size. It's kind of a nice way to scale it with it because we weren't using font size. The icons weren't using font size. You probably could using M's and rems or M's if you wanted to, but we have border radius, so it's a radius round. And in open props, this is just a huge value. I think we've talked about radius round before, even doing something like 1E5PX, which is the same thing as one with five zeros PX in there. It's a cool way to write a large number if you need it. But anyway, that's what's tucked behind that value. We talked about our background and our color. Um, open props comes with some really nice shadows. And what kind of floating action button wouldn't have a shadow being cast under it? So we use a shadow four, which is a pretty big shadow. And if you noticed, when we clicked it, um, it became a smaller shadow. And since open props gives us those shadows, we can easily do this on active box shadow shadow two. So we'll transition that box shadow from shadow four to shadow two on active state. And if motion is OK, we'll even move the element a little bit too on click, uh, which we'll go check out again here in a second. So here's our mini versions. Here's our sort of adaptive custom properties, adapting our motion, adapting our color, our SVG having its size. Um, if motion is OK, we're going to transition the transform. And that's going to be um, that rotation on the plus that sort of has that squishy effect. It has a little bit of elasticity. It's all done here with our custom property. Active, we've talked about. Here is um, if the button is active, hovered, or focus visible, we're changing the background color. So the BG prop turns into light BG hover, unless we're in a dark scenario, in which case it turns into dark BG hover. We could probably make a custom property here, another one called BG hover, and then just set BG hover to whatever these are and kind of avoid a little bit of this. But I don't know, it's a similar way to get the same task done. This one was interesting here. We have and not first of type. So we're currently looking at buttons. These are the fab button classes. And if it's not the first one in the list, it's going to get Z index negative one. And that's going to push those smaller buttons behind the first button. So even though they come later in the DOM order, that puts them on top of something in a, in a stacking context. And this makes sure that they're all behind that main one so that their shadows don't cast over top of that big button. The small buttons shouldn't cast their shadows over top of the big ones. And we handle that right here with Z index negative one. And lastly, this data icon plus for hovering on that particular button that has that, we're going to rotate that um, plus icon on the Z by a quarter turn. And I really like using turns, and that gives it that nice subtle effect. So I'm going to go back to our demo. You can see as I hover, we get that nice elastic. In fact, let's go to the animations panel. Animations, pull this up, hover, CR. Let me click that. Yeah, see our curve here? This is our SVG being rotated. It starts down and it comes up, and then it goes down under again. And that's what's giving that a little bit over rotation and a little bit of the under rotation as it goes across. It gives it that elastic effect. It's super cool. It's just a prop and open props and use it as much as you like. Um, also, if we click, notice that our shadow animates from that deep shadow to a much more shallow shadow. When we hover, the background color is changing from that pink to a darker pink. In fact, let's change to the light theme. And if we hover, we can see that it goes a little bit darker, right? We want to increase the contrast. We press, and it's going to drop. We're going to get less of a shadow, and we get a nice little floating action button type of effect. I hope you learned something in this GUI challenge. It kind of, uh, you know, taxed a lot of our different parts of our brain. We had to use clever animations. We had logical properties. We have um, adaptive custom properties, and all the little goodies that go into making a good strong button um, end up taking a lot of time. So I hope you enjoyed this GUI challenge. And I'll see you all next time. Take it easy.